Welcome to Three Witches and a Druid Podcast, a Canadian podcast about paganism in today's modern society. Hello, and welcome back to Three Witches and a Druid where we sit around, we're in this lovely living room, face-to-face, which is so great. And we're on part three of our little mini-series, talking about the Shining Ones, or our gods and goddesses. I'm Margot. And I'm Maeve. Gwen. And I'm Brian. So yeah, third part, as we discussed in the previous ones, I brought this up. It's in Druidry, we have major spirits, ancestors, and what we refer to as Shining Ones layman's terms, it's god and goddesses. I think we use shining ones to be gender neutral as possible, because there's all sorts of gods and goddesses out there, which I don't think they necessarily identify as any particular gender. So yeah, here we are. This is not going to be an all-informative deep dive in any particular god or goddess. We each may have our own pantheon. I don't know if any of you guys even have pantheons. We'll soon find out. Uh, <laughs> and it's just a general scraping of what we... Our thoughts on gods and goddesses are. And there's also the age-old question of, are they all individual gods and goddesses? Or are they all what is, and we just put the names and the faces to who we need or who we connect with at that time? That stuff is really debated, me and Michael Van de Hook highly disagree on that. I, I am a strong believer that gods and goddesses are personifications of thoughts, ideals, beliefs, feelings, that sort of thing. I don't necessarily think there's room up there with five or six guys sitting around playing poker <laughs> wondering if you're cheating on your taxes or not. They don't care about that. <laughs> but I, I believe that those entities have power. I just don't think they're sitting around wondering what in the world, how many times somebody masturbates or who's having an abortion or any of that <laughs> mumbo jumbo. That's all human foolishness. Yeah, exactly. That's all human foolishness. It's an interesting question because I do, in the broadest sense, think it's all from one source and it's different faces and different attributes. But I also feel that each one of those faces and our attributes and or gods or goddesses as you may see them then take on a whole life of their own they have a whole a whole life of their own so even though they're part of that original you know the the original source to me they still are individualistic coming from that source maybe in a way almost like when you have a baby you all come from like you got three kids you all come from the same source but you're still three individuals yes much like I that. really like that. That's a good that way to put analogy. That. I really like that analogy. So then there is the question. Mike's vision, I'm going to guess then, is that the shining ones are independent of human interaction with yes. them. Yeah. Whereas if you have a vision of them coming from the same source, they could be independent of human interaction, but also they could be a manifestation of our thoughts and feelings that we project onto them. We create a box. I'm going to use the term box. We create a container and that container becomes, it comes out of the story of Athena bursting from Zeus's head or, or whatever, you know, whatever the origin story is, then that story gets fleshed out. And so the creative process of people interacting with that story and then having individual interactions with that thought form egregore that is fueled by divinity, divine power, divine source, takes on those characteristics, but also there is egregores that then become self-directed, right? So even if they're human thought created and there's a a container created that they fill, then they become autonomous Mm -hmm. afterwards. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, there's also that sort of thought. I'm not jumping on either side of the fence, but I just, I'm, I, I'm always, um, 
Well, there is a, curious. There is a belief that similar to ancestors as discussed in the previous episode, the gods and goddesses only are as strong as the believers. Yeah. Like they only have strength because people believe in them. Mm-hmm. Much like the fairy where you have to clap. If no one's believing in them, then they have no power. They have no say. They have no control. Sort of mentality. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting that you say that? Because... I will admit my ignorance here. And when, when we, I saw the topic for today, I'm like, the Shining Ones. Why do we, we're not talking about the, that David Eddings novel. Really. <laughs> so I'm like, I've never, I guess I wasn't paying attention to the term. And again, in, in, in the David Eddings novel, they were going to this place where were these, these gods that no one worshipped anymore. So they were just these hollow shells and had no power. Right. It's, just, it's interesting that it was all in the same series of books. Yeah. Anyway. I do wonder that sometimes because I do on the radio show, you know, a god or goddess of the week. Because I have a Telesco's 365 goddesses and I pick the ones on that day. But I often try to find either a corresponding cultural one or something very different. You know, like one that you don't hear about. Like, who the heck is this? And you read about them. And then you wonder, and I have wondered, it's like, does that framework of that old god or goddess even exist anymore? Because no one's heard of them. No one's probably paying attention to them. Like, there's a thousand people praying to Apollo or Odin or, you know, more popular ones of today. But, you know, the ones that are long gone came before them. It's very interesting to me. I think about that. Anyway, that's totally often, often left field. No, no, it's, it's, but it's true in the sense of in the relationship between deity and us, we are important Mm -hmm. because the manifesting, like you were saying, the belief gives them the power to manifest Mm -hmm. in this world. Yeah. It's a tough one, right? It is very interesting. And I'm now I'm thinking very deeply. <laughs> I'm starting to, my brain is going way off on tangents that are just way too. It's the drinks. It's yeah. the drinks. <laughs> it's, 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 well, it's, that it's, might have affected you, but. Well, I'm a professional. <laughs> Well, you know, what? I really must say, I, I must give a, a, a real kudos over there to Brian for that time when we finally were meeting in person in my backyard. You bought that big jug of sangria. It's like, I want to drink at every one of our podcasts. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Yes, we're, we're very grateful that, we, that you purchased that book. Yes. yes we are. So, as you were mentioning, though, it's funny because I've mentioned in the past one of the Celtic gods that Karen and I worship is uh, Granis. He is a god of uh, mm-hmm. bathing, self care. And every time I mention it on an epi- and I'll, it'll happen again, I'll get four or five people messages like, Who's this? I Who's the, what's the name again? Granis. Oh, Granis. Oh, I thought like, you were I'm, saying Granis. It's like, oh, I want to know all about him. Like, Granis. Unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot about him. Mm. So every time you sort of say it or mention it, a few more people may like, oh, that's sort something. Sort of latch on Yeah, I didn't, know, yes. I didn't know them. Yeah. Well, you know what? You need to send that name the spelling to, to yeah. our, our <laughs> little <laughs> messenger. Well, I, I, we have a little blog post in the Grove of Nova Scotia. I just send it. And that's literally all the information we've ever been able to find. But hey, we really like baths. There's a Celtic god that's about baths. That's for us. That's, that's <laughs> right. Okay. Now, that, that's an interesting Again, in the relationship with deity, other religions have sacred revealed texts, right? Mm. So deity says this, and they have the sacred text that backs that up. We have story and tradition, and then, but we also believe and value our personal relationships with deity, however it manifests to us. But we do not assume when we speak to deity or deity speaks to us, I guess, that that necessarily is to be shared. Or if it's shared, we don't we don't assume that it will have value universally. And I noticed that a lot of current writing on the subject, they'll say deity says this. And it will have UPG after it, which is unverified personal gnosis. Well, I guess Joan of Arc had a whole lot of UPG 
because nobody but Joan knew what she and God said to each other. Well, well, that is interesting you say that, because when you were saying, should it be shared, made me think of Our Lady of Lourdes, made me think of Fatima, you know, all of these different places where, you know, people have had, you know, in, say, the Christian faith, people have had their visions and their images, and they had to tell everybody. Where we, it's like, oh, I'm not sharing that name. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and par- and especially when it's really personal and you're getting a smack upside the head. That's it. Well, especially, when you're getting, especially when you get in the smack down. <laughs> it's like, smirk up. But no, it, it is, I think that is one thing because it goes to what you were saying because we don't have a straight out dogma. We don't have, you know, those kind of texts, you know, where a mystery religion and a mystery can mean something different to everyone. But when these things do come through, it is a very personal. A lot of the time it's not, you need to go forth and tell everybody. It's nothing like that. It's, this is what we're, this is for you. It's very interesting. And I think that's the appeal of this path as well, is that we are responsible for doing the work ourselves. We are not sitting around waiting for somebody to interpret texts mm-hmm. and then enlighten us with their findings. It's up to us to create our relationship with deity and to interpret that relationship for us as individuals. Yeah. Because even in, as we all well know, if we do a circle and a working with a particular deity, we are all going to get different information. Absolutely. I do remember one circle we had when one of our friends, we were working with that deity in that circle that one time, and that's cool. It was her ritual, and she wanted to do a ritual to this particular deity, and that's excellent. I'm up for anything. And that deity was not that nice to me. It really wasn't. It was. It gave me a whole lot of she was almost she was bordering on disparaging to me it's like (laughs) okay (laughs) i guess she doesn't think much of me or maybe she's smacking me a little too hard here with this message it's like okay maybe not (laughs) it's very interesting oh no she's always super loving well she wasn't that loving to me (laughs) and not not that it was bad or anything and maybe i just wasn't in the mood to hear you know to hear that (laughs) but that's that's an that's one thing with dean that a couple weekends ago, I had a little chat with my the minister of my mother's church, Anakin Church, because they were doing this wonderful nature church thing, which was kind of an ecumenical. They had a Buddhist lady there. I was mighty impressed with this United Miss Anakin minister put this thing on. And it was, you know, everyone there was going, because most of the Christians were saying that uh, they had a hard time reconciling, you know, the Bible and in the church and nature. How did they twine the two together? And I said to him, I always had a hard time with that strict dogma. This was easy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I know there was another point I was going to make, but what were you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) I tell you, that drink, man. (laughs) It was only one shot. (laughs) Yes, but I'm a lightweight, man. (laughs) I'm a total lightweight. You know, everything different to everybody. Yeah. And, and, the message you get, and I know there was a point that's going to come to me as soon as, but that was very interesting, him and I talking. When I said, no, I said, that hard dogma, I said, I, 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 that was someone telling me all that. And that. I will say, you know, that whole, the concept of this part's only good, and you need that bad guy to explain the bad things in the world. Right, right. We don't really have that. No. All the good and the bad comes can come from your most beloved god or goddess. So I, I find that it's like, I don't know why they don't give, pardon me, in, in the, you know, in the monotheistic faith, I don't know why they don't give the devil his total due. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because it's always this big conflict and, oh no, you know, the, the God, God is always wonderful and merciful and loving and which is garbage. <laughs> uh, which is not always true. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and only the devil is, is the bad thing. I, I, I find that, no, we, you get the good and the bad from your goddess he, well, not you know it's like yeah we have gods of oh yeah that earthquake and that hurricane and that that that's not some bad work of the devil that we we got some well, and that's the that. funny thing devil's in charge of rock and roll and sex like, pestilence <laughs> flags and earthquakes that's all god's to me it's <laughs> that is always cold over <laughs> rock and roll and sex <laughs> it's true i was gonna say like 
what you were saying earlier, it's like all our gods and goddesses have pluses and flaws, and it's like Zeus is a poster child of that statement. Oh, <laughs> oh, Zeus is primarily flaws. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> He's still supposed to be yes, the king of the gods. Yeah, so, yeah. exactly. Uh, I always thought Hades should have gotten way more than him, because yeah. you know what? Zeus might be the god of the earth and all that, and the people that are on it, but Hades the god, is the god of everybody who's ever lived and is dead. I always thought he had a far, far larger following. <laughs> yeah, he had far more. He had far more, you know, far more street cred, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, and this is a bit of a personal question, but do you guys follow a particular pantheon or do you guys sort of pick and pluck? to what appeals to you for any given ritual moment time. I'm an eclectic. Yeah. And I do have a couple, like a couple of gods and goddesses that I do work with fairly regularly. But I certainly will, if I need something else, I will look around and I will see what I can find. Or maybe tonight we need this energy, something new, something different. And a lot of times it's in the archetype. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, I need to explore this. You know, this goddess isn't what I see. Now, that just might be my own limited mindset. Right. That I cannot, it's like some people will go to one god or goddess for everything, where I tend not to. Right. And so that just could be my, my, own, my own limited thinking. But I will explore others if there's an archetype that I'm finding is not happening. And the other thing that people need to know is that certain gods and goddesses can come and go from our lives depending yep. on well that's on, what I what phase you're in in your life finding now that you know I I worked with Persephone for so many years and for very obvious reasons but I'm feeling that I'm coming out of that cycle now and I am very curious to see who will present themselves next because I have no preconceived ideas of where this is going to go next. It's kind of exciting actually to me and it's going to have to be something I set out to consciously do. It's not going to just come. Well, now that I've said that, it probably will come smack me outside. <laughs> you, you're going to be at work tomorrow and it's going to come to you. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. and I am much like Maeve. I will, if I'm working doing a working or I'm challenged by something in my life, I will look for an appropriate deity to help me with that. And I think if this deity comes from a different pantheon, that doesn't lessen their value at all or, or their, their power and their skills. So at different times in my life, I have worked with various deities. And when I look back, so it was 86 when I first kind of came to this realization that this was a thing. And I would have been 23. But 10 years before that, and before I'd watched Robin or Sherwood, (laughs) I had dreams of Kurninos. I had dreams at 13, 14, 15 of a stag-headed figure that were not frightening but not comforting. So I don't I didn't work with him, but he was disturbing my sleep. Mm. Mm-hmm. He was disturbing my sleep and I had a lot of psychic activity at that time, which I don't necessarily, you know, when you read things about Kurninos that I don't really associate that with psychic work i don't associate that with astral travel or any of the things that were happening i think you could associate that with puberty no oh, yeah absolutely if you're about 13 years old and puberty well, and all exactly. that's coming in and he's a very procreation kind of well uh, exactly I mean, I, you know in high school i was the kind of kid that read freud so i thought it was a pervert but then, <laughs> in my 20s, I started reading Carl Jung, and I thought, no, you're just magical. That's, you're just magical. That's so much better than being a pervert, right? Um, and I have worked with various gods and goddesses over the time I say various. A few, a few more closely in my own personal practice. But I have really come to a place where I, 
Um, my polytheism is quite soft, and I see the world in a pantheistic way that it is pregnated with divinity. And that the way I think about it is that our human minds are too... It is hard to connect with a divinity that is so vast that from time to time I have to access that archetype mm. that and and I see divinity as that archetype and I see that that is very often the way that you know my small mind can create a relationship you with just, divinity you just put into words a thought that I that I've often that I've felt more than thought you just put it into words it's so vast that the only way you can grasp yeah. is in those arguments. And, and that's why there is just, that's why these pantheons are so big. And that's why also people come from different places. People have different experiences. People have a relationship with a specific God does not fit everyone because we're all starting from different places. And although we're all on a similar trajectory, how we get there and what's what we value on our journey there is different for everybody. So being able to just plug into deity in the area that is most fulfilling for you works best for me. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I think it's very interesting, Margaret, when you're saying the person that will come to you because sometime in the last year and a half, again, this COVID times run together when couple people were thinking about a, a, a goddess for a different time in their life, this group of us. And I was very surprised who came to me, but it was someone I never thought of. Mm-hmm. Ever, ever, ever. They came into my life, that, that particular goddess. And it was because it, it it really goes with what I'm going through now at this phase of my life. I mean, I'll say it out loud, I'm 54 years old and all of that, and my kid has grown, and but it was no one I ever would have thought of. But it came to me as opposed to me actively you know what I mean it's the first that's, that came. that's very yeah. very interesting yeah now some gods and goddesses are known to come knocking at your door versus waiting for you to come to them some gods and goddesses are known for breaking down your door and yeah. making their hands <laughs> while they mess up the kitchen yeah. <laughs> like examples like Odin and Morrigan for example are, yeah. there's a long history of them just sort of barging in taking over, mm-hmm. telling you what to do, not really giving you a whole lot of options. <laughs> <laughs> and off you go. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's interesting, though, that there, especially one particular goddess has been with me. If I'd have known I was a pagan when I was a teenager, I mean, I was, but I didn't know. Yeah. Right, right. But I would say that goddess has been with me since I was a teenager. And she is still with me. And I've discovered more side of her as time has gone on, you know, more than the the, the basic bullfinch definition, bullfinch's right. mythology, because what was there back then, right? You know, right? Yeah. You know, the bullfinch's mythology, she's been there. And, and even that, different parts of her evolved as I've grown. So, Brian, you're next. <laughs> well, so early on in Druidry, I had done some research and I seeked out Lou because it was the most connected one for me master of crafting that sort of thing and then unfortunately when my when my mother passed away that's when morgan came knocking and sort of decided what my path was going to be for a while but every once in a while like from that point on i hear the anvil of bridget knock and so I, i'm kind of leaning towards that a little bit as well i haven't done a lot of research but she keeps popping up in important parts of my life There'll be a statue or a book or someone will mention it at an off comment. It just keeps coming up over and over and over. So. And then uh, Granis is something Karen and I share. G-R-A-N-N-U-S. Granis. Yeah. And they're, they're a god of bathing? <laughs> well, it's a Celtic <laughs> god of self, um, self-care. Self-care. Um, oh. Hot springs, hot baths. Yeah. It's very little known about it. Isn't that interesting? His, his image appears three times in the lands, very close to hot springs. Near Bath, say in England, and places like exactly. that. Oh, yeah. Isn't that neat? I guess I, I'm going to be looking that up tonight. <laughs> See? I, a new yes. follower. Uh, yes. <laughs> have a back. Have a, well, you know what? 
it's like could be someone who was forgotten and now they're going to get yeah. all these followers <laughs> but that's that's part of Karen and I's a little daily ritual we have a bath everything I do like a bath I yeah. foolishly have a tub too big for myself but <laughs> yeah. that was how my husband's fault too big of a tub how, how yeah, it's not even possible long to wait to, for it to fill no it's not that it's when we built the house, my husband said, I want a bathtub that I can lay in. And the house was built. He was six foot two and all legs, and he wanted a tub that he could lay in. I said, why don't we just get, you know, a standard bathtub is five feet. I said, why don't we get five and a half foot? No, I want the six foot tub. Well, I got a friggin' six foot tub, but my toes barely touch, and the back of my head is barely touching one end. And to get enough water to cover me in, you not know about bath, drowning. bath accessories. Well, you I have a pillow. bath pillow. <laughs> That's the, that, it's too. Get a block of wood and put it at the bed, so you can put your feet on it. It's like, oh my god! And I do love it, but it does take it takes practically the whole water tank. <laughs> you don't sound like a very strong believer in granite. No, <laughs> I do love that. And until I, and I mean, for years and years and years, from the time I was, you know, like 13 years old until I was, you know, 35, I bathed every, you know, laying in the tub. But now laying in the tub is more of a treat because it's, oh my God, this thing, <laughs> I'm drowning in my tub. <laughs> I got one of those outflow covers yeah. yes. for my tub because you can that? get. You know that at the foot of your tub, there's that little silver part where, the it, sil- where it will yeah. drain. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's this like silicone cover you put on it, so you can get another like four inches of water. So what Margo is saying is that she's a follower of Loki and is just inviting the chaos. <laughs> <laughs> and being on the top floor, yeah. it's oh, yes. the people below her that will yeah. suffer. It's not her problem. And I do love laying in the tub, truly. Yeah. But I'm not, and if I, you know, it's like it has to be after everybody else is in bed, and uh, you got to wait till the water. T- well, no, it's and, and the water tank's got to fill back up because other people have been. Born. No, yeah. what the thing is is, if other people have had a shower right before me, I got to wait for the water tank. To fill back. <laughs> you need a better water. I need a like I a guess. Game. That's mm, another beauty one. of living in an apartment. Yes, there's uh, a we, we solar have water. we have solar water. Oh, um, right. Solar powered water. So, like, we can fill our top 20 times. It's yeah, super amazing. hot it's a, Do you have a water tank? I have, a, I have a great water tank. It's uh, it's oil fired, so it's almost instant. Oh, now, I know my. my uh, it's a heat on demand kind of thing? No, no. It, it's a 40 gallon, but oil fired over electric is well, very fast. It's much faster. I know a number of people with heat on demand and I we did consider it, but yeah, I think sometimes, you know, you, if you don't have that external stop, yeah. it's good to have a tank that runs out, yeah, right? Yeah. Because sometimes we just don't monitor ourselves that well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a heat on demand might never get out of the shower, right? Yeah, there's <laughs> like four people in my house and it's going crazy yeah. and anyway, but that's good. Okay, back to <laughs> yeah. I, love it I do love to lay in the tub. I've even got a fan and everything. It's wonderful. But uh, where were we? <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about different uh, pantheon. When I first came to paganism, or you started practicing, it would have been in the late 80s. I was about 21 ish, 89 kind of idea. And I thought that I had to pick a pantheon. Yeah. Don't feel oh, you, don't you have, have to, to do that. I did, I thought. And I'm like, well, the very first experience I ever had, of course, with Greco Roman, you know, kind of idea, this and that. And, but I thought, no, well, what is my bloodline and what is this? And as, you know, as a maritimer, our bloodline is 10 different things. You know, we're settlers here and so many different DNA strains in each of us. And then I thought, well, you know, that isn't quite doing it for me because I like this one over here. And that speaks to me, and this speaks to me. And so I finally said, stick this. <laughs> I'm just going to, just you know, I'm going to do what, what speaks to me. I was trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. Right. And then I thought, okay, I better, you know, I'm going to follow because, you know, over here in Nova Scotia, I'm going to, you know, follow a Celtic kind of. But no. Now the Hearn, you say Credinos, I often, you know, Hearn, Hearn. same thing, depending on yeah. whether you're continental or British Isles. It's but funny. I, Hearn has always been with me. At Druid Fest this summer, 
Michael Van Hook gave an entire workshop on how to pronounce his okay, name. Okay, so you tell me. Well, no, no, you have to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I still okay. get it wrong. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. No, no, I'm, no. I'm, I'm, I'm sure no. I Her, Hearn's been with me, yes. you know, from the beginning, and, uh, and Diane has been with me from the beginning. But, which is, you know, you've got that Celtic and yet you've got that Greco-Roman kind of deal going on. Anyone Actually, out there listening, you can switch it around. I, I almost, because I'm always the one that draws parallels where none exist. So in Norse pantheons, you have the Aesir and the Vineyard, right? And the mm-hmm. Vineyard is the land deities. Mm-hmm. And the Aesir are, the, are things like wisdom and all those sorts of things. And I almost think that you've made that division and oh. Hearn is your land base, right? He's the god of the wild wood and whatever, and the land of your ancestors. Mm-hmm. And the other, the Greco-Roman, is, you know, that's kind of where our our abstract, our thought, mm. all those sorts of things. It's almost that same division Isn't as the that Norse champion. Isn't um, that, that, they, that they cover that. And it, to me, it is also interesting because often when people make those divisions, they think of one as masculine and one as feminine. And the masculine will be that frontal lobe thinking, that abstract thinking and all that sort of thing. But it's your goddess that represents those characteristics and the god, which is the land deity. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Even though Diana is a... Uh, a huntress. Yes. But she's, you know what I mean? But she's she the comes. huntress. She's not the creator of the animal in yeah. the forest and all of that. It's very interesting. And even so, I still have, like, Kuan Yin. Yes. It's still that mercy and compassion. What I mean, not that I don't find I get mercy and compassion from Diana, but not really, necessarily. <laughs> okay. she, she's, 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 she's a moving, moving and shaking kind of girl. Yeah. Where, she, well, she's the one that... Yeah, you're hurt. Bandage that up and get your butt in gear. And Whereas I think Kuan Yin would be the goddess that would sit with you. Yes, absolutely. And and you say that. That's very interesting. That's how I was raised. Yeah. You may be hurting and you can sit there and you can cry for a little bit, but that's enough. Or yes, you may have got a bad cut or whatever, but bandage that up and get moving. That's how I was raised. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? I never put two and two together. Oh. <laughs> 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 and even so, and there is even, even Kali Ma is still kind of there. That that whole, she, she's there too, but Kuan Yin and, and the Demeter. But I discovered, I hate to say, I found that Diana was sort of taking a back seat for a couple, couple years. And then I read somewhere and, and did a little more research. And she's a triple goddess. Mm-hmm. She's the virgin huntress, the lunar virgin huntress. She's the mother of wild creatures, and she's the huntress destroyer, the death goddess too. So I'm like, well, look at that. And then she came shining on the back. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ryan, what I heard you say is you had like one or two, so you don't have a whole. Well, I, I whole follow crowd. like I follow like the Celtic pantheon. Okay, but okay. my patrons are like okay. Yes, yeah, sort of like your personal, yeah. Because yeah. Um, but like for our Grove, for example, our patron god in the Grove is Theranos. He, he's a part of every ritual, and then usually we invite now depending you, on the, the day. Hmm. Now you know there is no soft sea in, Ga- in, in Gaelic. It's supposed to be the hard sea. That's why I said I can't pronounce it right. <laughs> it's Crenanos, not Serenos. This should be the Boston Celtics, not the Boston Celtics, because <laughs> there's no soft sea. <laughs> that's, that's very, very, very cool. But even gods, I have the Hearn. I have my Hearn statue, but I, I'm also an Apollo girl. Yes, you are. That's I right. I am. So I have that very serious contrast there, too. I guess you have that but Diana. Apollo's, Apollo's the sun, too, right? Mm-hmm. It's not land-based. He's, yeah. 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 And, and even, you know, Diana, wrap it up, bandage it up and get going. And Kwan, you know, lay down, sit down, and I'll sit with you. And yet there's that other one, that uh, that Kali business. Well, you know what? Let's just tear the whole shit down and then rebuild it. <laughs> so I got a lot of contrast. Because <laughs> that's pretty telling about my personality now that we're <laughs> I'm having a really hard time as an Eden's child not to just yell, Kali mom. <laughs> <laughs> I, would love, I would love to. I know she's still widely venerated in, in, 
it, and so it's Kuan Yin. Yes, in, so in their Kuan respective Yin. countries. I would love to go to one of the, to Kali's temple. That would be so mm. interesting to go to the, speak to the people there. But anyway, no one's going anywhere too far in COVID. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's Everybody funny. every night prays for that to be over soon, right? Yes. <laughs> for that. To the to the shining one of your choice. Yeah. To the shining one of your choice. Now I think we touched upon this already, but a lot of pagans don't involve the worship in their practice whatsoever. That's a I wouldn't say a newer thing, but it's it's a more common it, thing in witchcraft. It has increased and yeah. I kind of understand that that again, if you're asking for things that you know, your ancestors are invested in helping you. If you're working to make changes, if you're wor- in your life and you're you're working magic, then you're most often working with spirits of the land or using the elements and the spirits of the plants and that sort of thing um, that you're working with. So you're making relationships with those entities. And so if I'm using mugwort, I, I make that request of the mugwort to help me. I was, and pardon my ignorance, I, I'd heard of this, but I hadn't really talked to anybody who was practicing that way. So this is how they do it then, obviously. They work with more spirits of the land and plants and the animals ancestors. and ancestors. Oh, that sounds very really nice. I would say my group practice most often involves deity, but my personal practice, again, I recognize that I am a small part in a enchanted universe. But when I am asking for things, I'm speaking to ancestors, I'm speaking to plants, I'm speaking to the animals or the spirit, nature spirits around me, that sort of thing. It's easier to for me to have a relationship with something that is here in front of me. Absolutely. I totally, that, that, yeah, that can be, that makes, it, it is easy. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Well, another interesting time sitting around talking about about our lives and our being modern pagans and I just love our get togethers <laughs> and I hope you all out there love our get togethers too because we certainly enjoy doing all this and sharing it with you so we're getting ready here to close up so if you have any questions or comments you can contact us through our Facebook page and I believe we have Instagram now yes we have an Instagram it's just three witches that a druid three witches are six posts Woo. We have posts. Yeah. I don't even know. You, you look up Instagram online. You got to make an account you to get in there. App, you have an app on your phone. I don't have an app on my phone. You have a flip Nokia phone. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? If it wasn't for the fact that everybody texts, I'd probably still have an old flip phone uh, or a landline. You can uh, contact us with questions or comments. Give us lots of thumbs up and stars. And I'd like to thank our Patreons who are helping us to give our editor uh, coffee. coffee, which is she's, she's very great to us, which is wonderful. Three Witches and a Druid Podcast would like to take a moment to thank our amazing Patreon supporters. Today, we shout out to Danny, Tania, Sarah, Lore, Kay, Linda, and Jennifer. Without your generous support and contributions, we couldn't bring you this magical content. And we thank you for listening. And until next time, everybody, merry meet, merry, merry heart, heart, and merry meet again. Bless, Bless you. Me. This has been Three Witches and a Druid Podcast. Thanks for listening.